Well, hey there. Thanks for joining us on the Do Business Better podcast. Got a great one for you today because we're talking about beer, and I know you like beer. Well, you know what? Maybe you don't like beer, but you should like beer. And the guy I'm talking to loves beer. In fact, we've loved beer together a lot. His name is Brad Klopfenstein. He's one of my very good friends. We go to the Indy 500 together every year. We met in 1990 at Purdue University, for crying out loud. And he is a budding beer entrepreneur who is resurrecting an old beer brand. Kind of a cool story. Thought it'd be fun because it's not just hobby. He's actually putting his money where his mouth is, and he's going to have his own beer brand. So he's going to tell us a story about that, what he's learned so far, what he hopes that can happen, where he sees this thing evolving. He's going to also give us a little bit of story of the history of beer. And you know what? There was a whole bunch of beers in the old days brewed by budding beer entrepreneurs. Then we got all macro beard, and then we got micro beard again. So anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about the history. Klopp, a budding beer entrepreneur resurrecting an old beer brand. I thought that was a good title. I love it. I love it. Um, so you and I have known each other for a long, long time, uh, last year, and I'm wearing the shirt, dear listener, if you're listening and not watching, remember that the do business better podcast is available on my YouTube channel. Just go in and, and hit subscribe. It doesn't cost you nothing. Damien Mason channel on YouTube. And they're all there. I mean, like, you know, a hundred and some of these things are out there. So, um, go ahead and check it out, but I am wearing my Alps brow t-shirt. And so you came up with this idea about a year ago, I bought the t-shirts Tell me about uh, this venture, but more importantly, the Alsbrow thing that kind of captivated you. Sure. So um, I'll just go the history of Alpsbrow. Alpsbrow was an old Indiana beer brand. It was brewed by Scent Liver that became Old Crown. And then the brand went to Peter Hand out of Chicago. But it was brewed in Fort Wayne from 57 until 72 and finished out its lifespan in Chicago. Um It was designed to be the brewery's 95th anniversary beer. And just like what happened to a lot of breweries back then, they they were a regional brewery um, that started getting a lot of of pressure from the national brands. And they also made some poor investments. They got uh, somehow involved with um, refining out on the East Coast. And I think while the beer and the brewery was making money, the refinery business was about to take them under. So <laughs> it, 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 it got, it's that thing where like I worked in a factory in college, as you well know, and the thing was held together with bailing wire, but it actually made a boatload of money. And then even like a 20 year old, I'm looking around, I'm like, where the hell's all the money from this place going? It's not going into this place. So they were like riding that one until it collapsed literally <laughs> while the proceeds were obviously they're going to another losing venture or just to somebody's pocket. So the beer thing, you know, is like Alsprow, you have this idea like, Oh, it failed because nobody wanted Alsprow. That may not be the case at all. No, no. So, I mean, as a brand, I will say this was, so this is one of the original cans. I think this was born out of the marketing department. Because it says Bavarian style premium beer, and it says from Mountain Valley hops. <laughs> there is no such thing as a Mountain Valley hop. Um, <laughs> so, hey, by the way, uh, the person that was drinking it probably didn't know that, and they didn't even know for sure where the Mountain Valleys were, or the Valley Mountains, or or the hops. Anyway, hold that can up again, just for somebody. That's, if you if you tuned into the video, you can see my cool shirt with the the Saint Bernard and all that. But that's a cool can. I actually have some of my beer can collection. When when Klopp said he was going to start this uh, thing up again, I said I've got some of their cans in my beer can collection. So. You got in the backdrop there, Alf Brown, 1957 to 1978. So it was a brand from 57 to 78. It was brewed in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, just up the road from my farm until 72. That it was uh, the Peter Hand Brewery. If you're a beer can collector, there was a bunch of beers that got sort of gobbled up by Peter Hand, sort of a uh, uh, a, a venture capital accumulator of uh, of companies, if you will, but then a bunch of them just failed from like uh, old Chicago to Ellsbrow to whatever. Yeah. So yeah, Peter Hand actually had owned Meisterbrow and they sold that off to Miller Brewing Company and Meisterbrow Light ended up becoming Miller Light that we know today, but they sold all their brands. So Peter Hand had a brewery, no brands, which they were also cash strapped. So they acquired a bunch of old brands like Alpsbrow and they squeezed every last nickel they could out of the thing at the very end mm-hmm. and until they just could there was no more nickels to squeeze out of it. So but it was fun. So a couple of years ago, just on a lark, it was over the Christmas holiday and I had an afternoon with nothing going on and 
I started cruising through the, um, well, I was thinking about old Indiana beer brands. I'm like, I wonder who owns all these brands. And I started cruising through the uh, U.S. Trademark Office's website. And I started looking up who owns all these things. And suddenly I ran across Alpsbrow and realized nobody owned that trademark. <laughs> so <laughs> it had been abandoned in, in 1994. So I went through the process of acquiring an abandoned trademark. And I had it. But the problem was I had a trademark and no brewery and no beer. As, as my wife, Sheila, likes to say, we had a beer, but not beer in a can. Uh-huh. So over, over the last two years, I have gone out and I have, we have stopped. We probably talked to two different breweries, anywhere from very large breweries to very teeny tiny breweries. And um, some were interested, some were not interested in brewing it. I didn't really want to brew it myself. I don't know anything about brewing. I don't own a brewery. So I figured it would make more sense to find a brewing partner and I would be more the marketing arm. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about that is uh, that there's somebody's going to say, well, you're not really a brewer. You're not making this. And before we recorded, I said, this is not a new thing. Um, You know, the, one of the biggest brands that's taken a, um, shall we say another, it's not even a victory lap. It's like back to being cool. Starting about 10 or 15 years ago, past blue ribbon was a beer. When you and I were kids, blue collar people drank PBR. Your dad probably had PBR in the fridge. PBR then was kind of on the way out. And then all of a sudden the hipsters and the skater kids decided PBR was cool again, but tell them the listener what the thing is about PBR. Yeah. Well, People, especially millennials, Gen Zers, they like nostalgia and they like that connection to something that their parents drank, their grandparents drank. It's funny, as I was talking to different breweries, two or three of them were like, well, I mean, how many, you know, Alpsbrow drinkers do you think are still out there? I'm like, well, no, no, we're not going after people who drank Alpsbrow 45 years ago. Those there's only six of them and they're probably on a restriction restricted diet where they're going to have one beer a day. Like yeah. you're not going to make money on that. You're going to make money off their grandkids that think it's cool to have this connection to something that their grandparents drank. Well, you missed my other, my, my question I was leading you into is that past blue ribbon is one of the most storied, you know, it won a blue ribbon in the 18, whatever, 1887 world's fair or something. That's the whole thing. How Pabst, which is a family name of Germans that came over and brewed and then they invented their blue ribbon because it allegedly won a, a award. But Pass Blue Ribbon does not have a brewery. No, no. It's just like yours. It's just like it's it's contract brewed. Right. So, yeah. So, Pap sold off all their breweries. So, they, yes, they own brands. They've got, they still, uh, last I looked, they had probably 30 trademarks of brands that you've heard of. Lucky Lager is theirs. Stroh's is theirs. Schlitz is theirs. Olympia is theirs. Um, Old Style is theirs. And it goes on and on and on, but they contract out to Miller Brewing. So Miller is the one who actually makes all their beers. So Pabst, as a company, probably only has a couple dozen actual employees. Yeah. Um, so Pabst is Pabst is a much bigger brand and much more drank by volume beer than what you are doing. But it's honestly, it's a similar business model, just ramped up, obviously, because of economies of scale. Right. Right. So... So yeah, so so Paps knows they they're like we can sell nostalgia. We don't need to brew it ourselves. There's other people that make good beers, and um, yeah, fortunately here a couple months ago, at Two Tom's Brewery that's out of Fort Wayne, they've got a tasting room in Indianapolis. Um, I had talked to Tom who owns Two Tom's probably a year and a half ago, and he'd hung on to the stuff I gave him, and he reached out to me here in November or so and said. Curious if you ever found anybody to brew this. I finally got my brewery to the point where I would be interested in brewing it for you. Yeah. So, so he, he's, he's got some capacity, open correct. capacity, and he can brew this. And we're not talking about, again, we're not talking about Paps. He's not he's not trying to make three semi loads a, a, a shift. <laughs> so no. he's, 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 but he, and this is going to come out in cans. So it's going to be cans and draft. Um, so yeah, so we're actually having, Two launch parties. We're having our Indianapolis launch party on Friday, February 17th. And then the very next day, we're going to turn around and do our Fort Wayne launch party. Uh, The cool thing about the Fort Wayne launch party, we are going to have members of the Scent Liver family 
who own the original brewery are going to be on hand and they're going to be tasting the beer and telling the stories as far as they know it. Um, a guy named Tom St. Liver, who lives in uh, Fort Wayne, is kind of the family historian. So he'll be there and he'll he's our age. And yeah, he'll, he'll be there having a beer and, and telling what he knows about the, the family history. So it's kind of cool to have that tie. Um, it's possible that the governor of Indiana will be at one or both of those relaunches so it's kind of cool there's there's been a lot of buzz on this and i and again i think people like that connection to history and indiana history oh, yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, yeah i think we're going to deliver it and deliver it well real quick back to the brewing so it's going to come out in cans and draft correct so you have okay. 12 ounce cans and kegs so you'll be able to buy it um initially it'll be on-premise distribution only so if you want to buy the cans, those will be available at a few select retailers or the brewery or the tap room, um, or there we'll have some uh, bars and restaurants. All right. I want to talk about the business stuff and I, yeah. I really want to hear more about this business. Secondly, okay. Tom, two times brewery is doing this. You, you gave him a, you told him here, here's the thing in the recipe or what you want it to taste like, look like, feel like, et cetera. And now you own the recipe or does two Tom's? So- Two Toms owns the recipe. I own the trademark. So basically, um, I get a commission on everything that they brew and sell. What if this Two Toms uh, guy goes out of business or the plane wrecks? Do you get the recipe so you so, can take it down the road? Yes. Yeah, so that comes to me. So, so yeah. So it, we're on a two-year agreement initially on this. Um, and we'll see. I mean, it's it could be a horrible flop. It, we might roll this out and we sell a few, you know, a few units to my friends. And after that, it goes nowhere. Um, if that happens, we part ways. Or if it gets highly successful and two Toms decides that they like being a smaller craft brewer and they don't want to ramp up production, then maybe I shop this around. But I I have a, a very good sense. Uh, me and my wife have met with Tom and his wife. They are good people. I think we are on the same page. And in fact, I know we're on the same page. So, so yeah, I think this is going to be mutually beneficial. So I found the perfect partner. Uh, and, 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 and we hope that works for you. So uh, if you have to look out here and look at this thing um, and the working parts of it, the part that you didn't tell me about was getting the packaging done, you know, You've got a T-shirt here with a logo on it, and you own a logo. How does this logo get on a can? And then, if you're doing, you're not talking about three truckloads uh, per per shift. Do you buy cans, and are you sitting on a thousand? Are you sitting on? Are you sitting on six skids of cans somewhere? Or how the hell does the packaging part? So it's one thing he's gonna have a vat of beer, and if someone's gonna go and draft, that's fine. You got some kegs. What about the package that I can go and buy at a store? So on the, the initial run on this, um, we're brewing 10 barrels, which is 20 kegs, if you will. But the way we're going to divvy that out, there's going to be a half dozen full-size kegs, probably a half dozen smaller kegs, and about 40 cases of beer that are going to come out on this first run. And I'm sure that that will sell out quickly. Um, I give I give Tom credit. I've been in, gone in and talked to him, and I'm like, listen, man, I know all the – I've got – 50 bars in the state that we can place this in. I know a whole bunch of liquor store people. We could ramp this up. And he's throttled me back saying, listen, let's start small and build this and make sure that we can service our initial customers and make this somewhat unique and make this a, a vehicle to drive business to our retailers. And, you know, we'll ramp up as we need to. So, so he knows the beer business better than I do. He certainly knows his business better than I do. I know how to market beer. He knows how to make it, distribute it. Okay. Well then tell me about the packaging, because if you're only going to have 40 cases of it, can you get, you can't get uh, the, the ball, the ball company that uh, obviously ball stays named after they make cans. They're not going to make 40 cases worth of cans for you. How do you do small batch cans? I'm just curious. Yeah. So he's got, he uses like two or three different suppliers and, a year or so ago, there was a can shortage, and they've kind of worked through that. Yeah. So there's cans available on the market. Tom stockpiles it and takes advantages of deals when he can. So um, in in his brewery, he's got several pallets worth of cans that are stacked there. 
fortunately, on something like this in the old days, these were you'd print on the can. Yeah, they, print, they printed big sheets of steel and then yes. it went through and they got cut and then rolled. I know right. uh, so, yeah. you're so, not doing that. Right. So modern canning now, this comes in as just a blank aluminum can and then it's stickers that get rolled on this. So, so yeah. he's obviously got eight or 10 other brands that he sells. So whatever's moving, he doesn't have to have dedicated cans for each brand. He could just run the cans through and then sticker them once they're ready to go. Awesome. So that makes the smaller scale thing more uh, attainable. So you've got stickers or you, you gave him the artwork and he said, I've got a company that does all this and it's already in his possession. Yep. So he's got a company that he's used for labels. So I gave him an original can like this, as well as a flat, flat can. So the sheet steel that had never been rolled and then a lot of um, graphic art for it. He sent all that, that over to his people and they rolled out something that would be acceptable in today's universe because you have to have a barcode on there and you've got to yeah. have the, you know, the warning label that goes on there and you have yeah. to update who's, you know, who the seller is. So um, he has taken care of all that, submitted it to the uh, Indiana Alcohol and Tobacco Commission that then approves the label and we go from there. Got it. Hey, do, do me a favor. Yeah, I think you bumped your table. Your your camera's been shaking a little bit. So, oh, yep, I am. I'm enthusiastic. I know. I appreciate your enthusiasm, but the viewers are going to get a headache and need to go and start drinking, which we encourage. All right. Um, um, on the money thing. Um, yeah, right. Have a beer. I'm going to have one with you here in a minute. On the money thing, um, does he say, hey, I'll brew this stuff for you, but I'm going to have my ties, my machines tied up, my vats tied up and uh, all that. You need to give me X amount of money in the short term because – I mean, I, if I'm him, I don't want all my stuff tied up with some dude that I just met. Sure, I like you. I met you and your wife. We had dinner. But that don't mean that I want to uh, have my capacity tied up with no money. Did you have to put money? Did you have to give him some kind of guarantee? Uh, I did not. So Tom has taken a leap of faith on this, that uh, that he can sell it. And again, I, I think it helps that uh, I'm a, an enthusiastic marketer of this and um, – and obviously, I've got enough contacts within the industry that it's going to sell initially. So I think that that's fine. But I still I, I understand, you know, uh, I, I was an enthusiastic seller of my book over here. But you know what? The printer didn't just say, OK, well, you know what? Whenever you get around to it, give us some money. They said you give us some money now because we're tying up capacity space for you. Yeah. So and actually, he, he told me up front that he did not want a partner on this. So. <clears throat> So, and good for him. But yeah, he knows what he's doing. I mean, Tom is kind of a brewing savant. Okay. So, you know, like some a musician who can look at sheet music and know in their head what it's going to sound like. He is like that with beer recipes. He can look and see what the recipe is. He knows how it's going to taste before it's ever actually brewed. He He knows what he's doing. So this is his business. It's not your business right now. It's a side right. venture. What do you... What do you want to accomplish? This is cool because you and I can drink a beer that you pulled out of the graveyard and and have this cool T-shirt that I'm wearing. And by the way, dear listener, if you want some uh, uh, some of this, he'll tell you in a little while how you can find it. But this is a cool T-shirt. It was in this color and in yellow, and I got uh, I got a couple of each, if I'm not mistaken. It's got a cool little St. Bernard dog on it. Anyway, the look is cool. It is definitely vintage, and vintage is cool, at least for now. Um, what's this going to be, a side venture, a hobby? Uh, a profit, a, a, a side profit thing, uh, something that we just get together and bullshit around and talk about that, you know, all of our buddies say, hey, man, let me have one of Klopp's beers. Or is it something that you think, no, this could end up being a business? So ultimately, I want that I want this to be a successful venture and I want this to be a moneymaker. Uh, you know, obviously in any startup scenario, your first year, if you can break even, you're doing well. Yeah. And, um, I, I hope to break even on this. Given well, you're not, that, you're not, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't go, you didn't go to this, the the bank and say, uh, I need a half a million dollars to start this thing. And I'm on, you know, it gets a little more sleepless when you're, when you're on, when, right. you're, when your ass is on the line for a half million, you're not, you're not over your skis. No, no, not at all. Not at all. So, so yeah, so we'll, we'll see how this goes. I mean, two years from now, we might look at this and say, all right, this is, it's time to scale it. We're doing great. We're at capacity with what we've got. It's time to expand capacity and, you know, and we'll see where we go from there. Um, Tom might decide to do it all himself. He might decide that it's time to bring me more into this. Um, right now, I am just an enthusiastic supporter and 
the guy that holds the trademark. But uh, but it, it's a neat story regardless, and I'm pretty excited to help bring back a little bit of Indiana history and brewing history. And I know that, uh, you know, it's possible that 18 months from now we'll say, well, that was that was fun, but there's just no legs here. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case. And I, I would like to think that, you know, two years from now, I don't think this was going to be a full-time job for me, but it, it will be more than a hobby. It will be certainly a side hustle that uh, that brings in some revenue. Well, and, and you can't really predict that. I always find it funny, and and you know, you've probably heard me say this because we've been around for a long time, uh, business plans. Bankers love business plans, and I always say, you need a business plan to borrow money. You don't need a business plan to make money. <laughs> a banker wants you to have a business plan, and then they like to say things like, now let's talk about where things are going to be seven years from now. Oh, for God's sakes. Uber didn't exist seven years ago. I mean, it's just, there's too much, there's just too much that can change. So I think looking forward seven years from now is probably silly, but we could look forward to six to 12 months from now, six, 12 months from now, you want it to be, and you believe that it can be a saleable product that's growing some, uh, growing some fan base and is paying its own way. Right. And I, yeah, I think it will. I mean, you know, it, there's the alcohol business is a big universe. Uh, beer sales are, have been fairly flat, re- really for the last 10 years yeah. and even craft beer sales, while they've been growing for the last 20, 25 years, even their sales are starting to become flat. So it's not like we're just getting on a train where lots of people are making money. We have to carve out our own corner of that universe and come up with a good product and good marketing and make sure we're getting in front of consumers. Um, spirits are really the, the, the hot, segment of the industry right now and and, and can, canned spirits with multiple things where it's like a canned cocktail with a dose of red bull and a shot of pomegranate it's like good god man that's too much for me well and you ask you know where's this industry going pepsi coca-cola they any of the big soft drink makers are wanting to get into these ready to drink cocktails yep. and i think you're going to end up seeing a lot of big legislative fights because those companies already have their own distribution network, but the 21st Amendment says that it has to be a three-tier distribution network, and you have to have a dedicated beer wholesaler or liquor wholesaler. And I think blurring that line between what's a soft drink and what's alcohol and how do we handle these, um, yeah, the, the industry's up. It's going to be a wild ride. Uh, by the way, the industry is up, but the beer industry is not. And that's what you just said. We're in a pretty flat beer market, flat to declining beer market. I'm told right. when I read something that I'm not told, I read that when we had uh, lockdowns, beer consumption uh, boosted up, well, alcohol consumption in general boosted upwards during the whole lockdown. And like you said, there's can shortages and everything else. But uh, it's important to look at the fact that you're not going to rely on just uh beer consumption and micros are, are grow, go, growing by 50% each year because then it first off, it'd be easy. Right. So beer per capita beer consumption peaked in 1980. Um, and it's been on, it was on a pretty steady decline up until eight or 10 years ago. And just overall per capita alcohol consumption started to tick back up. A lot of that has been spirits in the last few years. Yeah. Um, but consumers now uh, the per capita is kind of leveled off, but they're still spending money on alcohol. They're just, they're drinking better than they were before. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, obviously craft beers typically tend to be 50% to hundred percent more than your standard domestic beer, but consumers are willing to pay for that. And I'm banking on the fact that they're willing to pay for a very good product and pay for nostalgia. Which brings me to the issue of pricing. Um, you know, natural light will be stacked up to the to the rafters at uh, Walmart and they'll run hot sales on it where they're probably selling it at a loss or at break even. And you're not going to be able to do that. Who's setting the pricing on this? You or your brewer? Uh, my brewer setting the price on it. So he gave you guidance to... or he gave you guidance that here's what I recommend and here's what we think should happen. Yes. So there's a couple other Indiana, old Indian brand, Indiana brands have been revived by Indiana breweries. And we're going to be kind of at that price point. But when you say, are we going to go up against natural light? No. And it's the same reason that the local neighborhood tavern isn't competing with McDonald's. Yeah, they, right, right. You, you, you can't scale it. If you, if you think that you're going to compete with McDonald's, you're going to fail. Just McDonald's goes 
you know, they buy beef by the by the ton. And by the train, by the train, by the, by the yeah. they're, they're on the they're on the commodity markets on the CME group right now, buying futures and for uh for you know April delivery. And the guy down the road is going to Costco and getting 10 pounds at a time or getting it from Cisco. Yeah, there's no yeah. question. Hey, by yeah, the so way. Speaking of the pricing thing, so I don't, I don't think that that's going to be your issue. I mean, if you're a craft, if you're a crafty person, you pay for what crafty prices are. So pricing isn't going to be the issue. What is going to be the issue? Adoption? What's going to be the issue? What's going to yeah, what's so going to be the issue? Sampling and just getting in front of consumers and having people try it, and then repeat sales are always going to be your issue. Um, making sure that we have a consistent supply line, at least to our retailers. And you know what, if it has to be that we can only supply a dozen retailers, but people are beating a path to their door, yeah. so be it. I mean, yeah. Coors Banquet, shoot, they sold more beer when they were only west of the Mississippi than they yeah. did once they went nationwide. <laughs> uh, there was a lot more competition now, too. But you and I are helping. You and I are helping on the Coors Banquet thing. Biggest downside, biggest upside that you see. And by the way, we haven't even gotten the first can. We haven't even we haven't even, we haven't even cracked the first beer yet well what's the first what do you think upside and downside so the upside is i think that there's a place for this i think that there's their nostalgia goes a long way and yeah. and people are, are looking for that connection to ancestors history yeah. um that's the big upside the downside is as we know most startups fail within two years and mm-hmm. you know it, we're, we're coming out with something well I'll say it th- say it this way. Alps Proud went out of business for a reason 45 years ago. And, yeah. you know, there's a whole lot of reasons to go behind that, but it's a brand that already failed once. So whether or not it has longevity, uh, it's yet to be seen, but I think that we're giving it a really good shot. And, you know, fortunately, I've got a lot of connections. I know a lot of people. I've been in and around the beer business the bulk of my life. Um, Tom Carpenter, the brewer knows the beer business he knows his business and his customers um i think we got a better shot than most i like your point that you 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 began pitching this and then some people that didn't get it said well al's brow's been out of business 78 how many of those people you think are going to come back and buy it's like no for god's sakes there's 13 people that have had an al's brow they're still alive today or whatever it's so they didn't even think no we're resurrecting we're 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 it's kind of like you know uh, there was a new, a second Woodstock, uh, like in the 1990s. Well, they didn't get the old, you know, drugged out hippies from the 1969 Woodstock. They got a bunch of kids that thought they'd have heard about Woodstock. It's kind of the similar concept. They, they, and of course they corporatized the hell out of it and made it. So it wasn't even really like what Woodstock had been, but that's okay. The kids still thought it was cool. Yeah. Now, it, Damien, it was funny when I was shopping this around, I approached Miller Brewing to see <laughs> what they would want. I apo- uh, approached a, decent sized regional brewer out of Pennsylvania just to see what they would be interested in. I also talked to some teeny tiny brewers from around Indiana and it was interesting. The bigger ones were, well, the biggest of the big ones, they just gave me a flat out. No. Yeah. Right. One in Pennsylvania said, yes, we can do it, but you've got to do 5,000 cases at a time, which then gave me sticker shock. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't want 5,000 cases of beer in my garage. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, but then conversely, I talked to a couple of these smaller brewers around Indiana and I said, here's all the people I know. Here's the distribution we can get. Here's how much I think we're going to sell. And suddenly their eyes got real big and they're like, yeah, we can't make that much beer. We're yeah. not ready to do this. <laughs> and so, so I, I finally found that sweet spot where somebody that does their own canning has capacity, ability, yeah. knows the business and it, is has a passion for for selling it i mean I, I did have a bigger indiana brewer who was interested in doing it but they immediately wanted to send it out as their budget beer i'm like ah, it's brands don't you don't start brands off as a budget beer they end up as a budget yeah, they, 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 they 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 go they go they go to and what's the old thing in marketing there's the star the cash cow or there's something and then there's something that's like the turd i don't know i can't remember going back to my marketing classes yeah. speaking of marketing um one of my things i wrote down here was uh i've been at it for 29 years you and i obviously have a lot of history and we joke when we're having beers and soon that'll be over announced brow about the early days 
you've seen me out here hustling uh, for 29 years. Have you learned, is there anything that you say, this is one thing, if I have this beer going that I learned from Mason, is there, or, or any of your other kind of entrepreneurial, self-employed, small biz friends that you're like, there's a lesson to be had there, there on something? It's a fairly easy lesson. Most people don't adhere to it. And you're right. I mean, you know, some people say, oh my God, you were just cruising around on the internet. You found this and it fell into your lap. You're lucky. Like, no, I've worked my ass off for two years to try to get this to the point where we're going to have beer. You've got to be passionate about it. And, you know, it's so it, I, I had the wherewithal and, and the creativity to figure out where to go looking for something like this. And like I say, it's been two years of, me putting my own money in it to refresh yeah. the logo and and going out and interviewing all these breweries and trying yeah. to find somebody that's interested in a right fit for you the same deal i mean when you started off it was a you were a part-timer entertainer and one day you said i think i can do this and i mean it takes a lot of passion and a lot of belief in what you're doing to make it happen yeah it's it's there's the it's the work that nobody sees also because you're you're usually working behind the scenes a little more than people realize from your perspective let's talk about branding um i'm wearing one of your shirts uh i think i got a couple for some of my buddies and uh lori bought some of your magnets that's cool that's purchase product but branding today versus you think when alf Brow went out of business in 1978 back then you had billboards print TV, radio, um, that's pretty much it. Got a lot more avenues now to, and branding and advertising are not the same thing, but obviously they walk down the same aisle pretty well in lockstep. So what's your thought from 1978 today? Is it better for you, harder for you? I. It is easier today to find consumers with a specific interest. Yeah. So you can hyper-target certain audiences just because you can go on Facebook or anywhere online and say, I want to put my brand in front of this demographic and they can have this age range and this geographic region. And you can be Ge geo, geo fencing as they call it, where you can yes. just find 37 year old single moms in this zip code. You can find them. I mean, that's, and you can hit them with messages on social media. So it is, it's more refined or rifled to say the least. Right. So branding is good. I do think that there's a lot of craft brewers out there that get too cute. They get so elaborate on their packaging and mm -hmm. the, the finer details that they no longer stand out on the shelf. If you go to the cooler yeah. and you look, and it's like, I don't know who makes this beer. I don't know what the name of it is. Yeah. I have no idea why there's a robot on the label. And By the way, it's kind of funny you should say that. There's the old thing about uh, they love – they love brewing beer so much that they fall in love with their beer and they can't see from the eyes of their audience. And that's one of the things I know you've seen me always talk about is, damn it, I might be on the stage, but I'm just a product. Let's get some perspective from the audience. And that's the thing. I think what you're talking about, they stop looking at their, at their product from the eyes of their consumer. Right. So yeah, from a consumer standpoint, this, the logo stands out. It's simple. And it's nothing like what's being produced today. And I think that in and of itself makes it unique. So, I mean, heck, they they knew what they were doing 70 years ago when they, <laughs> they first started creating this brand. And you, you're right. And so some craft brewers get cute, and I think they're trying to carve out a niche that might not exist. Sometimes all you need to do is make a good product and make it identifiable and easy for people to get to. Yeah, well, the, the microbrewers that love the they they think it's all about just the taste of the product. And if that was the case, who the hell would ever buy Mick Ultra? It has no taste. So, I mean, the the brewer has to also have the concept of the marketing. And so, there's there's no question. It's got to be product and promotion. I'm going to show you one of my favorite labels. Is this? By the way, if you're just listening, if you're just, if you're just listening to this, I encourage you to go and check out the video on my YouTube channel. He's holding up a 500 ale made by Cooks. Cooks was an Indiana Indiana company, wasn't it? It was. So yeah, they were out of Evansville, and they've got they have a label that has an old 50s style roadster. Yeah, and there. a check and a checkered flag, and obviously uh, Brad Klopfenstein and I are big fans. Let's go ahead and close out with that. Uh, the venture. 
There's a lot of nostalgia. You love it. I love it. I can't wait to have an ounce brow. That's all cool. History of small beer brands. I just jotted down just the, since you and I both have, uh, I've got a picture, a map of my home state of Indiana here. I'm I'm an Indiana guy. Old Crown and Falstaff, both out of Fort Wayne, in addition to Ounce Brow. They're no longer either of those being produced. Drury's and Sterling out of Evansville Brewing Company. I'm thinking there was another one, maybe red, white, and blue to come out of there? Or There were several. So Drury's was actually out of South Bend and then ended up with Heilman and was down in Evansville. Um, Sterling was out of Evansville. You had Champagne Velvet that was out of Terre Haute. Mm-hmm. And Upland Brewing out of Bloomington is now making um, Champagne Velvet and doing fairly well with it. Um, I know that there was a group that tried to resurrect Sterling and they failed. There was a group that tried to resurrect Drury's and they failed. Um, Falstaff is still a brand owned by Pabst, but Pabst doesn't brew it right now. So, I mean, there, there's about as many successes as failures. However, on some of these old nostalgic brands, I've talked to some of the breweries around the country that have done this with local local brands from their area. For the ones that hit, it might not be the most interesting beer that the brewery makes, but it typically is their best seller. Mm-hmm. I like it. And not, not to forget uh, Dusseldorfer, which was a brand in like the early 1900s, then resurrected in the 1990s. You and I were the biggest fans of the Dusseldorfer from Indiana's Brewing Company. It turns out we didn't know that we were the only customers that they had, apparently, too, because <laughs> <laughs> they, they went out of business. Those guys also really like to drink their product. Yeah. Well, somewhere between us drinking, being their only customers and drinking a lot of it, and then apparently drinking more of it than us is what happened to the downfall of theirs thing. All right. If you want to learn more about this, this is a cool thing. It's a cool venture. We're going to keep up with this and um in two years uh brad kloppenstein is going to come back and tell us about his venture and uh maybe he'll be swimming he'll be swimming in house brow profits or he'll say yeah you know what it was a neat run but i think either way it's a cool story yep. if you want to learn more dear listener about this product um how do they find out more about this so um there's actually two websites just given that i've got a, a partner uh two toms brewing.com is that two a numeral or two with TWO? It's, it's the number two, tomsbrewing.com or alpsbrow.com. We'll get you, one takes you to the brewery, one t- one takes you to the brand, but they ultimately will funnel back and forth between each other. kind of the same and, and if you're listening right now, as you're driving down the road and you're saying, man, I love this idea and I, I, I'm, I'm going to get home and I, I want me an Alps brow. It's Alps like the mountains in Europe and it's brow, B-R-A-U.com. His name is Brad Kloppenstein. You can find him probably through me on any social media, certainly Facebook and um uh, in about another, well, February of 2023, there's going to be Alf Brow out there and uh, you can drink it. I'm excited for it. Damien, I'm thanks excited. very much for having me on today. Till next time, this is, his name's Brad Klavenstein, the Prox Alf Brow. My name is Damien Mason, and this is the Do Business Better podcast. 